Story 1. Am I the a-hole for showing up at my ex's wedding in a pretty dress? My ex and I had a peaceful divorce. We co-parent our three children together, and there haven't really been many issues. My ex is getting married to Stephanie. I like Stephanie. She has been great with my kids and makes my ex happy. My ex invited me to their wedding, and I was happy for him. It was my day with the kids, so it made sense for me to come because of his reasoning. When I arrived at the wedding, Stephanie thanked me for dropping the kids off and brushed me off. We had never had any issues before. I explained that I was going to stay for the reception, and she was upset. I was confused because I assumed she knew I would be in attendance. It turned out she didn't consider that I would actually accept the invitation. I told her that I was invited, and since I took the two-hour drive, I would be staying for the entire duration. She didn't like this response. Stephanie asked me to leave, and I stood my ground. She went on to complain about my dress upstaging hers. My ex and former mother-in-law helped her to calm down, and the wedding shortly began. I thought that was the end of it, but Later, in private, Stephanie accused me of trying to ruin her special day. She is convinced that I wanted to show off and make the wedding about my divorce. She said it was rude for me not to leave after the bride requested it because it was her special day. I told her that I am not responsible for her insecurities and once again reminded her that I have no interest in stealing my ex back. She extended the invitation. Should have expected her to accept the invitation. And I don't know. I don't know. Being asked to leave, it was her day and she can have and not have who she wants. But she also caused a problem. So I don't think this person should have been forced to drive like two friggin' hours back. I mean, especially if she was going to have to, I don't know if she was going to pick up the kids later or not. It was all just assumption on the bride's part. What do you think? Story two. Neighbor's kid won't move his car from taking up the two spaces in front of our home. After asking politely to move it, the family retaliated by moving all their cars to the road, taking up all the space adjacent to our home. California here, getting that out of the way. And full disclosure, it's not my home. The home belongs to my parents, but I house it for weeks or months at a time for them and deal with the neighbors enough to care. Plus, I love my parents and want what's best for them. It will just I will just be saying my home or my driveway so I don't have to keep saying my parents' driveway or my parents' home over and over. These neighbors neighbors moved in a year ago and have made life so uncomfortable for my parents, they're actually talking about selling their home to move. Their marriage home, with all the memories. I thought they were selling because they wanted to move out of state, but have since found out it's because of them. My parents' neighbor's kid is a very immature 20-year-old and has a beater he leaves parked in front of my parents' front yard. He has it parked in the middle so that it takes up all the space and no one can park on either side of it without blocking a driveway. It has been in three wrecks in the past year and currently he won't drive it. Why? I don't know. Perhaps it isn't in running condition anymore. All I know is it hasn't been driven in over a month. Well, until what happened next. I want to also mention they have a full garage. They also have the same size space in front of their yard to park in, which also happens to be always empty unless they have company. And a driveway that can fit and does fit three of their cars, including another beater that has never left the driveway since they moved in. I politely asked him to move his car when I saw him several weeks ago, and he flipped out on me, cursing and screaming at me. He followed me to my car and was yelling at my car door window to the point it had fog from his breath. Several days later, I visited my parents 
and he had his friends parking in front of his car so as to block my driveway partially while still leaving the spaces empty behind his car that would block his own driveway and all the spaces in front of his yard were empty too. I spoke with my parents and they said the kid had his friends doing that ever since I had asked him to move his car as payback. They said he's really mean and to just let it go. This did not sit right to me. So later, after visiting, I went to the neighbor's home to speak to the parents. I explained the situation and asked them to speak with the boy about moving the car and his behavior towards me with disrespect and language. Bad idea. I assumed they were decent, normal people and this was just an out-of-control teen. I assumed mom would just tell Billy, go move your damn car, or something, and it would be taken care of. Turns out he got it from mom and dad. I get the dad yelling at me to frack off and get off his property as the mom from another room starts bellowing about how I did not just tell her how to parent and he can do whatever he wants and frack me and my parents. I didn't know this at the time, but have since found out that my parents believe the neighbors keyed their car about six months ago. My mom asked the neighbor mom and son to not smoke at the edge of the driveway as it's right next to my parents' bedroom window, and they would be awakened by them talking while smoking in the middle of the night. Apparently, that set them off, and they would talk extra loud while smoking and would hold up a phone playing music to their window as an F.U. to my mom and dad. That's also when their car got keyed. So since I made the mistake of talking to the neighbor's parents, it has been upgraded from just the kid's one car and his friends when they come over. Now, the parents are retaliating, too. They finally moved the beater, but only to move their cars from the driveway to taking up the two spaces in, our, in front of our yard adjacent to the driveway. The one car parked just enough to have the front poking into our driveway. The beater was moved so it's parked on the other side of our driveway in front of our other neighbor's yard, but also sticking out enough to just be in the way of our driveway, too. Sorry for the run-on sentence. Did that all make sense? I hope so. This has been going on for a few weeks now. Is there anything that can be done? My parents just seem to want to let it go. Not only do they say that street parking is technically public parking and they can't officially complain about it, but they complain, but if they complain, the neighbors will only retaliate worse. My parents travel a lot and my work makes it so I can always be there to sit in the house for them. They fear the neighbors will do something to their property when they're gone. I used to think that they were overreactionary and the neighbor's kid was just rude, but this isn't right. Is there something that can be done to get them to move their vehicles and or protect my parents so they don't feel forced to move? Uh, probably just document everything. Get a bunch of cameras, start filming stuff, and, you know, just start keeping records and... You know, maybe make a YouTube channel out of it so you can, you know, probably get help. I'm apparently, and unfortunately, that seems to be the only recourse for some people. There have been quite a few uh, confrontations with people like this, and they've ended up having YouTube channels to document everything, and that's the only thing that seems to get, you know, police involved on something like this. What do you think? Story 3. The dozen donuts I've been bringing in every Monday doesn't count as my snack day contribution? Well, I guess I'll have to rectify that. Back in high school, around 2010, I used to work the closing shift at Dunkin' Donuts on Sunday nights. Per company policy, I could box up two dozen donuts to bring home with me before throwing the rest out. One dozen went with my dad to work in the morning, one came with me to school specifically my Spanish class, which was a pretty small and pretty tight-knit group. Tends to happen when a lot of coursework is practicing conversations with each other. This practice of bringing donuts every Monday sparked an idea in one of my classmates' heads. She's Anne in the story. Since it's so nice to have donuts once a week, we should do a weekly snack day where everyone can bring something in. They decided this would be on Thursday and said, i just continue bringing in donuts every week on Monday as my contribution. Everyone was okay with this, except for Anne. No, no, this snack day was Thursday, and if you aren't going to bring in a snack on a Thursday, then you aren't welcome to participate. I was pretty ticked, 
but what can you do? It's only one snack one time. Then I got to thinking about it. I was only required to bring a snack, not something sweet or delicious or even palatable. As long as it was edible, then it counted. My next closing shift, I grabbed an extra empty dozen boxes. I went to the store on Wednesday night and got a five-pound bag of potatoes. I washed them and put them right in the box and dropped off the box early in the morning to my Spanish classroom so nobody would get wise to the actual contents. Apparently, the earlier classes had seen the box sitting on a shelf and had told our class that we had donuts. Everyone was excited. I brought them up and put them on top of the Elmo projector, trying my best not to, betr trying my best not to betray the extra heft. They all scurried up excitedly, and Anne herself was the one to open the box. A blank expression turned to raw frustration. You were supposed to bring a snack today, she protested. I did, I said, walking up to the box and grabbing a potato, biting into it while making direct eye contact with her. You don't have to have any if you don't want to. Everyone shuffled back to their desks, and Anne tried desperately to grasp a new argument out of thin air, but it was not coming. I finished my potato triumphantly and brought the rest home for my mom after school. The box was checked, and she could not try to exclude me from the weekly snack day anymore. Everyone else in class who thought she was a bit over the top thought the antic was hilarious after they got over the initial disappointment. Well, I'm glad nobody else was too put out over this, and yeah, just... She was bringing in... You, you were bringing in donuts! And you're bringing in, in on Monday. What's what's the big deal? Why are you the snack cop? What Who put you in charge of that? Why was anyone even listening to her? Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 4. Hell Hath No Fury Like Me Scorned This story starts 31 years ago, but the revenge part was pure serendipity that began two years ago. I'm going to shorten some, most parts, because it's a crazy ride, but I'd be happy to answer any questions y'all have. I learned an absolute ton on this journey, and part of the reasons for this is to share it with others. The Beginning In 1990, when I was just out of middle school and my sister was still in elementary school, my dad met his third wife at the only gas station in our town. They soon moved in together and my dad abandoned us in our basement apartment to live on a shanty houseboat that didn't run to live with her. He would show up every other week and give me $40 for groceries. Eventually, someone figured out the situation and called my mom. We went to live with her, which was, believe it or not, worse. My dad and his shanty wife got married in 1991. Not long after, she called me and told me my dad's brain tumor had returned, it hadn't, and that he couldn't handle the stress of being around us. That the only people he could bear to be around was her and her son, Shorty, who was my age. When I called my dad to ask if this was true, he said it wasn't, and he just couldn't believe that she would say that to begin with. This was our last conversation until two years ago. The middle there's not much in this part. I worked my way through college, living in my car from time to time. My dad and I had no contact, but I heard from my family that he'd bought a house and put his son through some vocational classes. When my grandmother passed away, Shorty and Shanty Wife showed up in a truck and took all the furniture and anything else that wasn't tied down or already gone. Eventually, I went no contact with my dad's side of the family. I struggled for years, decades really, but I made it. And I have a great job and a good family now. The best revenge is living well, right? The pre-end warm-up. Two years ago, October 2019, I got a call from my dad's brother, Alan. He told me my dad was in a nursing home in another state. Great! and I needed to go see him because he needed my help. What the hell? Shorty had ghosted him. <laughs> 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 
The nursing home, coincidentally, was about 20 minutes from my house. And I saw an opportunity, and I went. The reunion was underwhelming. I didn't want to make amends, but I did want to hear how he wound up dumped and alone in another state. And it was a really, really good story. Shanty wife got lung cancer and put my dad in a nursing home before she passed away in 2017. She suffered, and I was happy to hear it, but sad that it wasn't butt cancer. Shorty became his power of attorney when she when she passed away, can't say that D word, and had been visiting my dad, living in my dad's house with his two children, and taking care of my dad's affairs since his mom passed away. But now he was MIA, and my dad was worried about him. He asked me to drive the hour and a half to his house to check on everything. That's all he wanted. He never even asked me how I had been. I agreed to go. I think out of morbid curiosity. I'd never even been to my dad's house. I did want to see where he lived with his real family for 30 years. I wanted to see what could have been my life. It was 50 shades of fracking awful. The grass hadn't been cut all summer. You couldn't get to the front door because of the overgrowth. There were three pickup trucks in the yard. Two were full of trash. Cabs and beds and back seats, just trash. Mall, mail, clothes, paper, shoes, garbage bags. I couldn't understand it. My dad's handicapped modified SUV was on four flats and full of garbage too. I didn't have a key, so I just walked around. From what windows I could look through, the inside was in shambles and hoarded to hell. On the front and carport doors were dozens of notices from the city that they were going to condemn the place. The carport was also hoarded. Boxes and boxes stacked on each other, most rotting from the rain. The yard was full of garbage, broken Christmas ornaments, more shoes, rusted tools, old toys. There was a letter in the mailbox notifying him that since the house was abandoned, mail would not be delivered anymore. That night, I googled powers of attorney and how to use them. I went back the next day and showed my bedbound dad the pictures on my phone. He vowed to beat Shorty's butt, then asked me to help more. I told him I would, but he'd have to sign the power of attorney over to me. All of it. Durable, financial, and medical. And if he didn't, he could figure this stuff out by himself. He agreed, so I set about finding a lawyer who would drive to another state and do the paperwork in the nursing home. Bless that lawyer for being so good at his job, because all I did was tell him what I knew, and he put together a beautifully bulletproof power of attorney. It was full of stuff I didn't even know I would need. He also filed the paperwork to revoke Shorty's power of attorney. And now I'm unstoppable. We're from a small rural town, and it's the creepy and it's a creepy landlocked place that no matter how long you've been gone or how far away you've been, when you go back, you'll see someone you know. Even if you don't know you know them. It's like playing seven degrees of everybody all the time. It's suffocating, but it can also be helpful. The beginning of the end. I got to work the next morning. I didn't know how scorched the earth would be when I finished, and I didn't want Shorty or anyone from his prolific inbred family trying to find me, so I made sure nothing I did had my name on it. I opened a Google account for my dad and got a Google number. I opened a P.O. box for him in his town. I put in a mail forwarding notice. I pulled his credit report. I took the power of attorney to my dad's small town bank, changed the address on his accounts, and got new account numbers. I requested copies of every transaction back to the day Shanty Wife had passed away, about 13 months worth. I had to go to the main branch, two hours from my house, the next day to pick the records up. I sat in the lobby all afternoon, going through the account. I cornered a service rep and got a crash course in his debits and deposits. 
This is when I figured out the extent of Shorty's staggering stupidity. My dad got about $5,000 a month in disability and social security every month, twice a week. Shorty was going into a branch and withdrawing cash, all of the cash, for 13 months. And every time he did it, as the power of attorney, he had to sign a form stating that he was acting on behalf of my dad. And that form was notarized by the bank. I went through every withdrawal and got the bank to confirm that every one of them was made by Shorty. Then I went to the house and called a locksmith. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea what was waiting for me there. He got the first door open and the stench rolled out like a fog bank. We both gagged. Two locks later, I was so embarrassed by what he had to see and smell, I gave him a $60 tip. And with shiny new keys in hand, I called the cops. I told them I was power of attorney for my dad, was checking on his house, and there were three vehicles that didn't belong to him. He asked me if I knew who they belonged to. I said, no, and I wanted them towed. He told me to call a tow company and he would meet them there. They showed up with two wreckers. The tow truck guy got out and asked me for a signature. I only signed my first name. As I was signing, he asked, Do you know Shorty? Running on pure hatred at this point, I surprised myself. Do you? I asked. He said he did and that he's, an, he's a jerkwad. He's a butthole, is the word I can't say. I responded, He might be. Hey, can you do me a favor? If you see him, will you tell him... M-N-W-N-M -N -N is coming for him, or whoever this is telling the story is coming for him. His bravado evaporated. He knows a crazy shrew when he sees one, they towed the trucks. When everyone was gone, I opened the door in the carport to peek in. The sun was going down and it was dark in the house. I heard something faint, and after some seconds realized it was the roaches and the rats doing their roach and rat stuff. I could smell it all in my hair. I sat on the carport steps and watched the sun go down. I was mad. Just so fracking cosmically livid that 72 hours was all it took to dissolve three decades. And here I was, stinking and listening to rats and cleaning everyone else's stuff up. Taking time away from my family. And for what? I had a coming to Jesus with myself. I could either bow out now or double down. And the thing is, I'm tenacious. To a deity damn fault. I had to be, I had to be to survive. And this was a bone I couldn't put down. The thought of Shorty's life being upended, his only source of income probably disappearing literally overnight, and my dad having to hear secondhand from me, that he's broke and alone made me absolutely giddy. I desperately wanted them to both lose what they had left. So I decided I was going to triple the dog down. That night, I googled restraining orders. And it was surprisingly easy to get one. I went to the courthouse in my hometown, went to the clerk's office, and told her I needed a restraining order. I filled the form in a in at a rickety little table while I was there. I wasn't prepared to see a judge that day, but she took the form and said, okay, I'll see if the judge is still here. That kind of scared me. She took me to the chambers, to his chambers, and as I was waiting, I looked around and saw he had certificates of appreciation hanging up from various veterans groups. Then I wiped my palms and thought, fish in a fracking barrel. He asked me about my dad's stint in the Marines and about the Department of Defense office logo on my sweater. I'm a contractor. He read my form and granted the temporary order. I would have to go back for the permanent one, where Shorty would be able to argue against it. Then I went home and googled biohazard companies and elder abuse statutes in my state. I hired a biohazard company to shovel all the stuff out of the house, for $7,000. I would have paid double. They found my dad's mummified dog under some pizza boxes in the master bedroom. They sent me pictures and salvaged some papers. 
Shorty was served during this time, and a hearing was set. I got to work collecting and documenting stuff. I made pictures and spreadsheets and timelines with cross-references because, frack it, they now had my full attention. The paid versions of Truthfinder and Trello seriously got me through all this. In my spare time, I went to the nursing home and gave my dad 8x10 copies of the pictures of his dead dog. From every angle. Before court, I went to the police station nearby and told them I wanted to report an elder abuse crime. A white-collar detective came out and told me it was a domestic matter and that since Shorty had been power of attorney, everything he had done was legal. And this was the day I got to teach a small-town detective about the fiduciary responsibilities of a power of attorney. Thanks, Google. I handed him a copy of the statute with the applicable sections highlighted. Then I handed him a thick folder with bank statements, pictures of the hoarder house, and dead dog, a copy of my dad's credit report that showed he was tens and tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and a spreadsheet listing every cash withdrawal with a running total of the stolen amounts. The grand total was just over $130,000 in cash. That's not including the lost value of the house or the credit cards he opened and used. I told him he could keep that folder since it wasn't the only one I had. Then I told him I would wait for a case number, and I sat down. He came back about 30 minutes later and apologized, said I had a case, and gave me a case number. Then I headed over to the courthouse. This is the end. There were other people there, and I had to wait my turn. And while I was waiting, that stupid motherfracker schlepped his sloppy butt into the courtroom. By himself, and obviously, literally, non-metaphorically dirty. His shoes were untied, and that turned my giggle box over. Then it was our turn, and we stood up. The same judge asked me some questions, asked him, him some questions, and asked me if I had any proof. I had a very thick folder of it. The judge asked me if I had gone to the police. Well, yes, sir, I have. Do you have a case number? As a matter of fact, the order was granted permanently and for life but not before the judge halted proceedings and told Shorty he needed a lawyer. Someone told me that the courthouse would have a copy of my dad's DD-214, discharge papers, so while I was there, I got a copy of those because why not? I also used my power of attorney to take Shanty Wife off the deed to the house. That way, if my dad passed away and it went to probate, Shorty had no immediate claim. I also went and got copies of my dad's birth certificate and shanty wife's death certificate. Technically, stepchildren can't request that info, but the clerk who waited on me recognized my dad's name and told me she lost her virginity to my Uncle Alan in the 60s and went to my grandparents' funeral, so I got all the forms I wanted. Shanty wife left my dad $50,000 in life insurance. About 35000 of that was left since Shorty was spending my dad's money and not his mom's. So I opened an ally account and transferred every penny over. Then I set up recurring transfers for the monthly deposits. At any given time, there was no more than $100 in his account. I also found a house flipper that paid me enough for the house to pay off his mortgage. That's the thing about probate. There's nothing to fight over if there's nothing there. And I made sure there was fracking nothing there. My dad passed away thinking he still owned a house. Speaking of which, this is about the time I found my dad's life insurance policies. They were up to date and Shanty Wife was the beneficiary. My power of attorney didn't allow me to change beneficiaries, but it allowed me to assign them. And since Shanty Wife was gone... There was technically no beneficiary. This is where the death certificates came in handy. I assigned my sister and me as beneficiaries. Irrevocable, too, which means that the only way to change that is for my dad and me and my sister to agree to it. I kept my dad in the dark about all this. 
The only thing he ever really knew about was the restraining order and his gone dog. I found out that he had purchased the gravesite next to Shanty Wife and wanted to be buried next to her. This was just never going to fracking happen. I googled national cemeteries and found one he qualified to be in one, and found out he qualified to be in one since he was a disabled Vietnam era veteran, so I arranged for that instead. All the cherries on top. My dad passed away in June this year, and I was there. He's buried in a national cemetery far away where no one will ever go visit him. The only obituary I ran was on the funeral home's website, and that only for insurance purposes. I wrote it as vaguely as possible. There was no service, his urn is purple, the color he hated most. I got a call in August from the prosecutor's office in my hometown. The lady on the other end is married to my first cousin, because of course she is. That's how it fracking works there. Shorty was arrested just after midnight on July 1st, was still in jail, and had been arraigned on felony elder abuse charges. He's facing 10 years in FPMITA prison. Oh, we know what that means, don't we? It's time for Urban Dictionary if you don't. She told me not to expect the trial anytime soon, as it can take up to three years for that to happen. I told her that was awesome, since the uncertainty will hopefully haunt him. And after that, he's still got prison to look forward to. He lost his kids. He lost his dad. I'm spending his mom's cancer money. He lost his free house and trucks. He has no credit and will never be able to get any sort of decent job and will hopefully for a long time not be able to find a decent place to live. And I sleep like a fracking baby. I don't think I can top anything by... Uh, except for saying, what a story. It was a privilege to read that one and to act it out, and I hope you enjoy my reading, too. Really nothing else to say. Just knew what she had to do and did it, and just was really, I mean, this defines Tenacious. Great job. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.